Eston Mines. The year was 1850 and gold was struck with the richest seam of ironstone ever found. Thus started 99 years of ironstone mining in the Cleveland Hills. This video is made as a tribute to all who worked here and in the ironstone mining industry. May God bless you all. Join us now as we bring history back to life. Old Row. This part of Eston was nicknamed California and stood at the foot of Eston Hills below the great ironstone mines. In these hills saw the largest ironstone mining industry to ever take place in this country and saw production of iron and steel which can be found all around the world today. So we're actually on California Road which was known as California Bank. On this side of the road is what was known as Texas and on that side of the road is what is known as California. As you're aware, what we've covered is everyone, the immigrants, the Quakers and everyone else all came into this area to set up a shanty town, living in little houses and things like that. All these houses on the right here were built by the company who ran the mines and these were employee houses. Obviously there was more employees than there was houses so some couldn't reside within these properties. They actually lived in little shanty towns all in this area. Uh, most of this area was just field and allot allotments where they grew the own produce. And like I say, on this side was the first side of the um, the town building up or the area known as California. Up to the top here, where we go up to the first part of the mine, would have been a footpath which led right away down to this location. And in the in in the event of an accident within the mine, the the persons injured or the persons who deceased would have been brought down this location on a stretcher and carried to the miners' hospital, which we've just covered down the bottom of the hill. So you'd say we're on actually on the trustee line. The trustee line came out of the mine down the hill on the tramway, and it would have got to this point where we are now, and then it would have formed. Uh, turned on points onto the singular track which then ran off to the Eston branch line which is right along the coast right way through Grangetown South Bank into um, the furnace area of uh, the industrial start of Middlesbrough and then it turned left and went right way up to where the, the blast furnaces and smelting plants were in fact we can actually go there because the old wall's still there right so yeah. we will so what we're standing on here, folks, is, what did you call this? It's New Bank. It's the, the last of the, um, when they started the mining, it was Old Bank, which was the foot of the hills where they first quarried and then went into the outcrop. Then they opened up the trustee line, which was the trustee shaft. And it was only called trustee because of the people who owned the land, the trustees of the land. So right. they named it the trustee um, mine shaft. And then later on, as they overworked these two first areas, they then moved round to the side of the Cleveland Hills, which, we, which we're uh, covering. And then they start working on what they called New Bank. And they carved the tramway into this location and that path came all the way through here where we where we're going through now what we can do we can bring up an image of where the the fork in the road or what i call the v in the road where the mine shafts sorry the tram tracks come down from old bank trusty bank and then new bank which is this one we stood on here and this is the junction where all three lines met together so we're actually at the junction now where all three Almost, lines... Almost, just through them gates there, which is that little walkway. That's so kind good. of preserved that in history, just to let you know this is the old trackway. So carts weighing over a ton would have come hurling down here uh, 
rolling on the, the gravity and not any other system. And then obviously they had methods of stopping these carts, which they normally put a hump in the track. And as it hit that hump, just like the roller coaster, it slowed the ride down to an almost stopping point where the braking system would kick in and then the turn it up. I think point. we actually have a picture of this hump. Uh, yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut that cut in. Cut that in now, yeah. 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 I'll cut that picture in now, folks. And that would just reduce the speed on the longer tracks which come down from the hills that had these humps. And that was to kind of, a bit like the roller coaster, if one cart's getting too close to the next, they need to slow it down a bit. So that little hump just allowed the other one to get a little bit more ahead than the first one so there was no collisions and it also gave the guy on the point system which was here enough time to turn that cart around before the next one come hurtling along so we've just been talking to a lovely lady who lives in this house here her name's Kath and she's allowed us to film the frontage of a house but she tells us that this house here, this big white one here as you can see in the background used to be the manager's office to this intersection of the tramway here so the trams used to run from the trusty line down from Old Bank and down from New Bank all the way down to this point and the manager's office was here this house belonged to the manager who was in charge of the um, this intersection of railway track from here it used to travel down to the tip yard which is in Eston High Street where the new builds are there now the old the new garage is there and I will show you a shot of that and from there it was then put onto other wagons and sent off by steam locomotion uh, motive trains into Middlesbrough itself where it then was taken to the blast furnaces so what I was going to say is this is the route that they brought the bodies down from the mine yep and uh, an interesting point that we mentioned on our way here was these people who lived in these houses knew the state of that person by the way they were carried on if the stretcher. If the person was carried head first down then they were still alive I believe. If they were carried feet first down then obviously the deceased. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, if I've got it wrong then it's the other way around of course uh, but the people used to come out of these houses the miners, the miners wives and families and they used to know when there'd been an accident um, and how the stretcher was carried down the street and all the people from the mine would follow with respect straight down to the bottom to where the Eston Old Miners Hospital was and then how they carried that person patient down would would tell these people whether this person was still alive or unfortunately deceased and the old old hospital still there you say the footprint of the hospitals there and new houses are built on it but the actual footprint was preserved the original big stones which stood in the gateway may still be there right um, and uh, there's a, a wrought iron um, plaque on the front to show that what it used to be right what we'll do now then folks is take you there and show you that and uh, we'll, Neil can explain a little bit more when we're there Eston Hospital built in 1884 for the ironstone miners of Eston and the ironworks of South Bank sadly closed in 1981 So we've just climbed Lazen B Bank. This bank leads down to a little lay-by which goes out onto the 174 next to Lazen B itself. This is the area where Marley and Vaughan would have climbed, discovered the iron ore back on the 8th of June 1850. And then as they worked their way up the bank, they then came across this outcrop of ore 
And it was at this point they realised that, in their exact words, it's an abundance of iron ore to be mined. Now the area we stood in, and here we are if we turn round here, we've got the same, we're actually within the iron ore seam here. And all this area was quarried first prior to Vaughan uh, digging into the land and mining. So a lot of it was quarried from this area and we'll show you some of the areas where you can see the ed evidence of that. And just up here as we continue we're going to come across what's called the fan house, the Gaibel fan house, known to the locals in this area as the SS Castle. Oh yeah? 1871 it is, yeah. What was this then? Well, this looks like a... a I mean, Eston, Lazenby Bank is as far back as the 1800s. So was it a, a, a bridle path from one village to the other? Going that way, you're heading towards Nunthorpe if you kept on the south side of the hills, bearing in mind the highest point is the nab. So is, was this a path from here to Nunthorpe? Honestly, yeah, you're up the top, you mean? Because this is where they pulled the carts on it. Yeah, so this is a tramway. This leads to Chandler's Pit. Uh, on the right hand side up here we have the Gable Fat House known as the SS Castle and turning back that way which is just obscured by the tree line unfortunately that takes us to yeah, the back is. top where yeah. the pulley system would have pulled everything along here uh, and it's a slight incline um, all the way to the top and then it's downhill from there right. for the carts so, the, the, I'm just sort of getting my bearings here, and uh, for the people who are watching, this way would have been the new bank. We're on new bank. Tramway. Yeah. That, new bank. The one that goes straight up vertical from the V is the old bank, isn't it's it? The old, old bank. This one to the left of the V, as you're looking at the V, in the, is this, is, is this one. This is yeah. new bank, yeah. yeah. And, and the other one was. On the other side, which we'll get to, is the trustee. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about the shaky footage guys, but uh, I'm not using my phone at the moment with a gimbal. And what we're just coming up to now is what's known as the Geibel Fan House, the SS Castle, which that's where it's known to as by the locals, is that right Neil? Yes, and it's only because of the steel reinforcement yeah. on the side of the castle, which had the yes. The I'm going to turn you around. Here we have the 1876 Belgian designed Geibel fan house. Inside would have been a huge steam powered fan, 9 metres in diameter and more reminiscent of a paddle style water wheel. This would have turned at around 49 revolutions per minute, which doesn't seem like much, but would have been sufficient to draw up the steel air caused by excessive dust along with gases released from the use of explosives thus making the drifts slightly more habitable. I can't feel bad. Yeah, it's flooded down there. It's flooded so far down, but it's not too bad here. Wow. And this is, this is what was used to draw the air up, wasn't it? Circulate the air. Right. Uh... There isn't much to see, Neil, not at all. This torch is worth its weight in gold though.
Wow, this is some So up here the wheel would have been spinning or going that way whichever way it did it would either draw the air in or it would take it out through that so one last look at the air shaft folks in Eston Mines the Geibel fan house known to the locals as the SS Castle further down there it's flooded and there's no way we can get down there anyway and I do believe that so far down there there is a collapse too anyway we'll make our way out that's pretty good so that's going to follow you around yeah even if I run down that track for half an hour well it may be not catch you that quick Neil <laughs> yeah, maybe I can't run that quick that's right <laughs> well you know walking yeah. up here I certainly couldn't run anymore no. in fact I nearly needed the hospital that we've yeah. been to visit this this pack isn't for the drone it had a spare bottle of oxygen in it and it's used all of it here. for me yeah yeah, yeah. it's um, for you for those who don't know it's a hell of a walk up here isn't it it is it must be like a one in three in places in an incline in a uh, uh, obviously coming up the embankment what's the opposite for descent ascent ascent the ascent is about a one in three for those who know the uh, percentages of hill climbs uh rough terrain it's fairly dry around here which is good considering we're higher up and the, there's been a bit of rainfall uh but we know where we're going to now to show you the other part of the mines and some really interesting parts you're going to get to see uh, the footings, just like you see here, all these footings, which are the concrete plinths, which are like this one here. Then we're going to get to see them, uh, but a more grander scale. So we're now walking along the tramway, which takes you from the fan house to the front fascia of Eston Nab. What we're trying to work out, let's just see if we can do this, guys. So we're on the tramway, and we've probably got less than a mile to go before the next foundations we're looking for and if we zoom along here as far as the camera will keep focusing and keep everything in shot right up here somewhere is the actual foundations from where the pulley system started so let me bring this back and I'm going to turn around and show you the route we've just taken so we've come from that direction but this direction has snaked in and out and it hasn't been a straight path so the question is for anyone who's watching and would know the answer to this please leave them in the comments but if this tramway was on a pulley system which we're going to show you evidence of that in the next shot how did the tramway carrying all the ore get pulled around each bend because my take and Paul's as well is you would have attached the rope on the front carriage pulled in excess of 30 carts along this tramway with a hook system on the front of the first cart carrying the ore probably 30 tons of iron ore getting pulled along but every time it come to a bend along this tramway which it is a snaky kind of track how did the pulley system work around each bend? More than 30 tonnes. Oh, yeah. Because each cart held two tonnes. These areas here are part of where it was quarried as well. So, as you see there, we're going up the face. Eston Nab is just up there. It's not too far away. And either side of this track, you can see where parts have been quarried out. So, we're on an embankment at the moment because, obviously, other side of that track has been quarried away and obviously the trees have grown since then we're talking 1850 when this uh, this was first dug out and things were put into place so the question is how did the pulley system work on the bends of this tramway see if anyone can leave that answer in the comments please by the side of the tramway that runs through the woods from the Eston Mines are the remains of the Keith Fan House. 
it was used to ventilate an area of workings near the Lowther Drift. On the side of one of the concrete foundations is the inverted impression of the company name. So what you all, you should know because of what Neil said already, that is we're actually walking along the old tramway. And the tram, the carts, is it a tramway? Is that what they called it? It was classed as tram because it was on narrow gauge uh, tracks. Right, yeah, so it was pulled along, wasn't it, on a pulley system. Yeah. And what did you just say we're coming up to, Neil? Well, the original foundations for the pulley system, which pulled all these carts along this track, are, are going to become visible. There's little plinths along here now, uh, and something similar to what we've just shown you there for the what we originally thought was a ventilation shaft is all going to come into view. Um, not sure about that, but just around this bend up here, we have a good open area which uh, you get to see if you can just look at the image and imagine what was there and we're going to bring a picture in to show you the original uh, buildings and chimney stacks which are there so this is the place that we're coming up to now so what I want you to do when we get to these concrete plinths here like I mentioned before guys, we're on a curve here. So we've got a slight turn into the left. I'm gonna show you the walls of these concrete plinths. And I want you to look and see where the, the ropes cut into the concrete. So on some of them, it's quite obvious. This is not as proud as some of the others, but it might not show up on the camera as well. There's another bit there so you can see where the cables were rubbing against some of these but on steel cables, they? yeah but some of it ah there's a classic one there there's perfect one where it would have gouged in i think they've actually crumbled because of the weathering So this had stuff on the top here. Hmm. Whether that's original or not, I don't know. So the other part will either be exposed down here, what we can see, or it's buried in there. So these are the other man entrance here. And we have a plaque here, which is probably going to say Lazenby Wildlife Walk. Yep. Lazenby Bank Nature Reserve. Wow, the mine entrance yeah. nail, eh? Yeah, this is uh, this side. And there's the foundations through there. You can't see them on camera, guys, but we'll take you to them down there. So, Neil, what, what, drift, was this, what drift was this? This... This doesn't... This is on New Bank, but it doesn't have a drift name. We right. can't find it anywhere. So... This is now being blocked off and there's a little... There is a little peephole here. Yeah. There? But we just can't find a name on it. Neil, I'm going to take a walk in, yep. buddy. Yeah, right. I've got your back, mate. Yeah. So, guys, as you can see... Do you know what, Neil? These, these brick, this brickwork doesn't look that old, does it? This was only recently bricked up in the late 90s. Was it? Right. And this is what we came to see, folks. But as you can see in there, there's been one hell of a collapse. In fact, what I'm going to do is Try and focus that beam. Yeah, you may be able to get through up that point there.
But yeah, it's all collapsed in, I'm afraid. So we can't go any further in there. I mean, we could get in and possibly get over that, but we're not going to. I mean, when you're actually in these places, you can get a sense of feeling about what took place in here and the amount of workers that uh, worked here. I mean, in its lifespan, um, not so much this part, but the trustee mine had over 400 fatalities. Whether that encompassed all the mines in the Eston Hills, I'm not sure. But, uh, so, three, two, one, go. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have said three, two, one, mate. You never say three, two, one. I only do it just to get you to laugh. You don't clap your hands and you don't say... Because that smile of his is absolutely no. fantastic. <laughs> It'll be different anyway, tomorrow. it warms you yeah. that. Oh, it will be, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, what we've done is... Well, we're standing in front of this mine purely yep. for aesthetic reasons because we want to talk about something called board and pillar. And that was the method of mining that was used here. It was either called board and pillar or spitting and judding, wasn't it? Yes. Now, to explain this to you, a board is nine foot long by nine foot wide, and this is what's, what you can relate to as a corridor, yes, am I correct? an area, a wide area. So once they've dug this out, then they would dig off, um, a tunnel off at right angles and create what's known then as a pillar, and that pillar could be 60 to 90 foot square. Yes. So, um, and they do this until they actually covered the whole area that they were given. So, and this system will actually help support the roof? Yeah, it, it stopped the, I mean, you have to remember guys, we're talking about a seam of iron ore here, and, and we're not talking this thick, we're talking 13 metres in, in minimum thickness up over, and they were going down as well. So in order to support all that tonnage above them, they had to make a vast pillar to support that in increments to keep it well balanced and all the way it was supported. So going on from that when that given area was actually um, pillared out what they then did the men began a system known as judding yes so uh, do, do you know much about this judding neil um the the judding was the the posts which were made to put in there and support the the excavated area yeah so what they did was they get to a certain area then what the men started to do was backtrack and pull digging it. out the pillars yep, yep. the 60 by 90 foot or well, it could be 60 to 90 square feet yep. and in the process of doing that then they'd put the props the in to in, keep yep. up the um the roof to, well obviously yeah so but when they've done that um the end result was a cavernous space wasn't it yes um and that was known as what well, they called it a jud, uh, and it gave the miners and uh, the mine owners maximum output. But they also did a strange thing, didn't they? Um, at certain times, they, they used to take the uh, pillars out. Yeah, uh, in, in, towards the end of that area, that district which had been worked, they would then pull the lot out, leaving a vast cavern of empty space. And then you used to get what was called the creep, and the creep was that creaking of the that cavern. Uh, bearing in mind, like I said, you've got a vast square footage of area which now doesn't have any pillars holding it up in in areas equal to the next square foot, and you've got this vast seam of iron ore all wanting to push down. And it used to call what they called the creep. It used to be a creaky, eerie bone grinding did noise. They, did they swear some of the miners used to say that it would move? It was it, it would it was like tectonic plates. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let me just explain one thing. The seam in this area isn't layers of ore and stone like that. Because of the Jurassic Age and the Ice Age which which swept over this land, the actual layers are like that. Yep. So the plates like that, and it's been compressed over 65 million years, right? And they're all laid like that. So when you cut in at an awkward angle and remove square sections out, like we talked about, you then have a layer like this, which wants to creep down. And this is That's what right. used to happen. It used to slide down. Now, this creek could go on for days, months, 
or even longer and then all of a sudden once that weight shifted to a certain point that area came down and you could the miners used to say that you could hear it happening in other areas of the mines bearing in mind the sound traveled through every corridor and echoed throughout but if you were in that area when that was creek started then you had to get out of there otherwise there was that risk of that coming down on top of you and now it's time to head up to Eston Nab, the site of a Bronze Age burial mound and an Iron Age hill fort, but more commonly known for the great monument that stands looking over Eston. In early 2014, for the sum of £15,000, Eston Nab was purchased from its private owner by a voluntary organisation known as the Friends of Eston Hills. This organisation counts as a member Craig Ormby, a local filmmaker whose best known work is A Century in Stone. Very little remains of Upsal Pit that once stood proud on the top of Eston Nab. The row of houses known as Barnaby Moor or Pit Top have now been demolished, but they were still in existence until the late 1940s. So we're now over on the other side of Eston Nab and we're on the side where the trustee mine would have been the entrance of the railway leading down to the point where it would have went off to the Eston branch line. Just walking up a big hill, which again has wore us out a little. And rumour has it, there's a World War II bunker just here. So we're off folks to the, uh, what is this, it's the powder house. Yes, we're going to go find the powder house. This is the last point of call for us today. And hopefully we should find it. So after some trekking through the bracken and this whole area this time of the year and the rains we've had, it's absolutely just covered in heavy bracken. And we've actually crawled and been stung and nettled and everything else just to find this, this uh, powder room. And it's not the powder room where the ladies would go just to dab a bit of powder on the face. It's a powder room where explosives were kept for the mine because obviously you had to store them somewhere. And I'm now getting nettled even more. If I cry like a baby, please excuse me. And here we go. Right, so this monstrosity was shielded, it wouldn't have had a roof, but as you can see around there it's got an edged wall, kind of decorative, and all the explosives which were taken into the mine were kept in there, which we're going to have a look in first. Let's just make sure nothing's wrong here. Looks like someone's doing a bit of wall art or something similar. So every morning the miner would get here and he would ask for these explosives. I don't know what they called them, was it a pinch? Um, And this was designed that in the event of an explosion, it would fall in on itself. So yes, this was designed that in the event of an explosion, everything would fall in on itself. And it's not that big, but no, uh, no, it's gunpowder. And this has been redundant now for, well, since 
1949, which was 20 years before I was born. So work that one out. So the miner would turn up at the beginning of his shift in that doorway. He'd ask for his quantity of dynamite, explosives, gunpowder to take down the mine and we're only feet away from where the original trusty mine entrance would have been. It's no longer there. There's no evidence whatsoever uh, of it ever been there, but it's only because of the maps we've been following. It still shows where every entrance and track and tramway has been. How are you finding it in there, Neil? Very flat, actually. Quite flat? Yeah. As I was saying, guys, it's, uh, it is an amazing piece of history. And I, for one, feel blessed being here. Because it, it played a, bas a big part in, in everything around here, didn't it? It absolutely did. It, uh, people came here for every entrance of the mine. If they needed explosives for the day to, to carry out their year, they had to walk to this near place. Do you want to come in here? Pick up the pinch of uh, explosives. What, what was a pinch? Uh, I forget the value of it. Uh, just, uh, just pop that on there. I think the term came from from the actual amount they actually pinched into the uh, pinched into it and then threaded it into the hole, which they had to mechanically dig themselves. I have to excuse the sweat, guys. But one thing we haven't mentioned yet in in this, and I know we are going to narrate stuff over stuff over some of this footage, and we've probably already done that anyway. So this this might not make sense, but from. 1850 to 1949 everything in here was done by hand right the mining industry every whole board had to be hand drilled with a huge thing which one man couldn't lift it took two and even oh, when the big well, right? even when the steam and the water pressure tools came in we were still talking heavy machinery which your normal handheld power tool would be able to do now these guys were doing it with, with industrial st style and size machinery. And just to drill one hole wasn't something me and you would do with a hammer drill within minutes. They spent hours and hours doing it. Then they blew that area out and then the mate had to pick all them pieces up, some almost as big as him, and pop them into a cart before putting the tokens on. Well, he was them with a big sledgehammer yeah, yeah. Into, into uh, sizable pieces. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. I mean, they walked for over an hour yeah. some, in, to get to some places in the pit. And they had to, what was the, was it Hill, Hill View? The bank that they walked down inside the drift? Uh, I forget the name of it now. We'll, uh, we'll have to pop it in yeah, the we'll comments it just here. Now, yeah. yeah. But uh, they had to walk on that, and some, sometimes it took over an hour to get yeah. to work, didn't it? It was something inclined, wasn't it? it yeah, was like... hill, somewhat inclined. But we'll, we'll pop yeah. it in anyway, yeah. so yeah, but uh, that was fascinating. Mm -hmm. And then they'd do a full day's work, yeah. and then they couldn't come out at the mine entrance. Yeah. They had to come out over Chandler Pitway. That's right. Um, out of one of the air shafts, didn't they? That's right, yeah. And, and that way, and then they had to walk home. Yeah. I mean, and then climb in the bed, probably still in the same clothes as they were when they left. And then the next morning, when the the the, the other family member, because they all worked at the mines, they come home, they kicked the father or the son out of bed. He went off to work, and he he went down to get some sleep. I used to say that the bed never yeah. got cold. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> there is one area not too far from us in this area, in in this location where we are, uh, or should I say in, in, in this area where we live, where uh, we're hoping to cover, and there's an old uh, church kind of community centre there. And we know that it used to be the communal baths for that area. So the mine which was there, um, when everyone returned home, they actually went to something like a large 
church hall mm. and all the baths were laid out and the miners climbed in them and got washed uh, and then obviously went about the business. Uh, we know it's getting renovated at the moment and we're hoping to get a peek of that, even some photos oh, as yeah, well. definitely, yeah. But it's been a fascinating day today, hasn't it? It has. Um, we've, we've got some footage of the um, the old incline and uh, for the mine itself where the railway would have went, the original tracks. Uh, we may be adding some more footage to this now um, after this just to see what else we can add to it and make sure you've got enough footage. Uh, for well, the also enough information, yeah, yeah, yeah. because uh, mm -hmm. we, we've done a fair bit of research and we, the, obviously you'll have seen the narration and and everything like that so you should have a, a relatively good idea of what went on here I mean you can only do so much in a video no. and you can only say so much can't you yeah I mean but to, you've, you've got to come and visit these places to get a feel of how yeah, they were absolutely it's a shame that we couldn't have gone into any of the mines here yes it? it's a shame but it's it's they've been closed for so long and yeah. in so this repair well they're in a poor state and unless uh, that is your field of work i.e. mining like some of our friends or followers then we wouldn't we wouldn't uh, risk our lives at this point i want to say a great big thank you to the guy who kind of brought this to teesside and got everyone interested in this and this is a guy called craig hornby uh, craig hornby many years ago as you may know if you're watching this made a short film called century of the storm a century in storm and the century was 1850 to 1949 and this was the 99 year lease and running of these mines and he documented all of this over um, a huge 20 something year period and put it all together in the early noughties and that, that DVD is still on sale for now. Uh, you can find him at Pancrack on YouTube, Pancrack, uh, or type in Craig Ornby Century of Stone and, and that will bring up much pretty much everything we've covered but in a lot more detail guys. His YouTube channel's Pancrack TV. Yeah, yeah. Pancrack TV. Yeah. I want you to pop over there. If what we've done today has inspired you, uh, then you, you you need to follow this guy. We are going to go back over and cover the pit top pit, the, the top of Upsall pit, where uh, everything was taken in and out and that, that that's going to be a special one. That it was, is going to uh, be a special yeah. one. Uh, there was a village up there, wasn't there? But yeah. Um, the community lived on yes, top of the highest point of the mower and other than where they lived I mean it was very remote winter was there was snowed in and during the day everything was a 10 mile walk for the nearest uh, local newspaper well they did I mean they, uh, every night at half past five you used to have to walk over to Pinching Thought Railway yep. Station to get the paper yep. and on the way back they'd catch the tea yep. and rabbits and stuff like that. And the, the, the groceries were ordered uh, by a guy who came all the way up to the top of the, the moor, the village, mm. took the orders and then a week later it came into the mine from the uh, main entrance here all the way through to the Upsall pit which is pit top and then it was brought up in buckets right to the top of the pit which is some <laughs> thousands of feet high and then someone went and collected well, their well, they groceries. knew what when it was coming didn't yeah, they? yeah, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. it was good yeah. it was a good thing it's it's a lot easier now just to click online and get your groceries oh dropped yes there's, off there's at no, your door. no that's right and if you're lucky they'll bring it into your hallway and get and unpack it for you but what they used to say was when they ordered it um i think it was a week or two weeks sometimes they had to pay there and then yeah you know before and then the new two weeks later it was what time what time it was coming yep. up yep. picked up absolutely you know, mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah so we, we should leave it here now eh? yeah it uh i hope we've brought as much as we could to this uh in in the space we've managed to do it in the poor uh light we've got as well uh, but it's backed up by a lot of footage which we're going to add to it which we've already had to it i know i'm recapping here but it's uh yeah we'll we'll uh we're hoping it's gonna um we, we, what we should do is have a catchphrase, you know, like Mark and Miles. And <laughs> <laughs> we should do something like that. For, but yeah. uh, anyway, yeah. from Paul and Neil, it's been a pleasure to bring you this, and uh, we will see you on the next one. Yes. So bye for now.